If you find a way to do what others don't want to do to get people what they want, you just get a whole lot of what you want. Life insurance is a selfless act initially because we have to have it a long time before it becomes a great investment. And that means we have to, I call it a four letter word, it's L-O-V-E. It's because we love somebody. It has to be a love in our life to care about having life insurance at the front end. We need to know how to face the discovery of the problems and the persuasions our clients have with a good discovery questionnaire. And then we know what is in our toolbox and we get back to what Wade Faust says, a basket approach of tools. All right, guys, my guest today is Curtis Cloak. He and, actually, uh, he and I actually shared the stage about 10 plus years ago at a, uh, an insurance marketing organization's conference for their training of their insurance agents and financial professionals. Uh, he was uh, doing a lot of the income planning type classes. I was doing a lot of the marketing classes. And here we are during the COVID-19 reuniting back together again. Uh, Curtis, uh, glad to be back with you again here, at least via Zoom. This is great. Great. It was, uh, it was uh, fun that back there was 10 years ago getting to know who you are and, and uh, getting uh, kind of a Text from you out of the blue was kind of a blast from the past. It's great to see you, Matt. Uh, you've always been a lot of fun to hang around. So, hundred percent, Matt. Yeah. And what what prompted this was actually your your appearance in Insurance Newsnet magazine here a couple months ago of your full spread. Look at that! Look at that <laughs> mug shot. Yeah. yeah, and uh, what you had to say. So, uh, for those of you that's on here, you're looking at ways to be smart with your money. If you're looking at ways to consider changing career, to consider change into entrepreneurship and more specifically inside the life insurance industry, well, you got a guy here that came in here from the farm and 30 years later, uh, he's not farming um, uh, uh, agriculture, but he's farming economics and money to help people gain confidence and clarity with their finances. So I'm glad you're with us, Curtis, because people that watch our YouTube channel, Seven Figure Squad, are people thinking like a millionaire. They're strategizing like a millionaire, so therefore they can become one day a first generation cash flow millionaire them to themselves too as well. So, um, how's COVID treat you, man? Before we get started, man, how's how's COVID nineteen? I mean, it- <laughs> well, you know, for the last ten years or so, I've been traveling a couple hundred days a year, speaking all over the world, uh, Singapore and Australia and Abu Dhabi and and uh, Canada and, and other places and. And uh, I'll never forget, I, I think I spent one day at home in January, two days at home in February. Looked like that was going to continue through June with all my schedule. And uh, I, I remember coming home finally from Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, just did a two-day event for American College um, in Newport Beach, California. Stopped, did a stop in Phoenix. Got, uh, got uh, a flight through Minneapolis. And I couldn't believe when I got off the plane that there were six people in the whole mall of the Minneapolis airport. And I've been flying through that airport every week wow. for a lot of years. And it was like shocking at three in the afternoon on a Sunday when everybody should be heading to their Monday destinations, how empty the place was. And it was, it was then, it was only then that I realized something truly crazy was going on. And when I got home, it didn't take me long to set the studio up that I'm in right now in my home and realized I was going to be hunkered down for a while. And so, uh, <laughs> Uh, the joy of that was I got to stop and slow down. I got to uh, finish all my booked events. I got paid for every event that I was booked and everything was done virtually and uh, went off as good as one could expect it to go given, given the virtual events. But uh, I, you know, that's given me a lot of opportunity to really refocus on my practice because I have offices in Oregon, offices, New Jersey and here in Iowa and my son runs the Oregon office, and I have uh, my software guru hand, handles the New Jersey office. And um, my son, unfortunately, not only do we have the pandemic, not only do we have you know the riots and everything else that just really was crazy right. distractions, but Josh is in Oregon where the fires were, and his town was the first town to burn down. So Joshua has lost virtually everything he has, and and so we've had to pick up a lot of slack. That was a blessing, right? That wasn't running around like a crazy chicken that could really focus on our clients and give him a reprieve. Um, and so it's amazing how it's worked out, but I've absolutely benefited by the force of slowdown and the focus refocus of the practice. And it's been a lot of fun and it's been very profitable. Um, and we've been doing virtual work with clients in all 50 States for about 15 years. We're in go to meeting for about 12 and then we moved to zoom eventually. So we've been on zoom for a while before the pandemic 
And uh, we've just even further refined those skills and worked with other advisors to say, there is a way you can market, there is a way you can still sell uh, virtually, whether or not you meet face to face. And that's really been a vital thing for us, a blessing that we were kind of already in that spot. It's interesting. We uh, made the shift to Zoom too as well, because we, uh, as soon as the pandemic hit, they said, okay, we're going to do a mass email. We're going to invite everybody to a, 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 a PowerPoint, you know, pre- a, a online presentation and, um, and go to me and said, we're good guys. We're good. And we, 5,000 people confirmed next, you know, we do, we hit, you know, broadcast and next, you know, 500 people are showing up and what will happen to the 5,000? <laughs> Somebody inside go to meeting, forgot to check out the box to click 5,000. It was 500. And, uh, you and cut a bunch of people off. Yeah. And then there was a time where everybody was on the internet and the internet was slowing down for everybody. So it was, yeah. it was, a, it was a weird adjustment. Have you gotten the COVID yet? I mean, my son and I, a nine-year-old son, we got COVID-19. We recovered after three days. Have you been staying healthy? I've gotten it. Josh has gotten it. His kids and wife have gotten it. She's the local doctor there in Blue River. Plank burnt down. Yeah. My parents have had it. Uh, you know, knocking on wood, everyone in our, in our family's trucked through that thing. Yeah. And not not without some some element of symptom or whatever, but but pretty unscathed. Uh, we're lucky ones. I've got a couple of clients right now flat on their back at the University of Iowa on ventilators. So uh, it's a serious matter, and we, we can't judge it by our own experience and just ask the grace of God that we don't have difficulty. But uh, uh, but yeah, it was, so it's touched us and it's been around us, and we have to respect it. But it's certainly no reason for our practices to be denied or clients to be denied the services they desire. And it's created all kinds of evidence of the reasons we exist. And so it's time sure. to step up, put up, and sometimes, and in some cases, shut up and get yep. your sleeves rolled up and get to work. So let's dive into that. You know, according to your article here, a lot of people need a, a, to really take a time to find ways. I mean, if it's a slow down, it's time to focus and, and step up and shut up. Mm-hmm. What would you say would be the areas of their finances where that is the most important? Yeah, so there's a, so really some unusual times here, and, and I'm not sure that the financial indicators are really relevant to what we're going to see. Uh, we've seen some unusual markets. We're seeing it to, you know, yesterday we saw a new high of 30,000. Um, right. and, I, and I believe that uh, forget elections, forget pandemic, forget riots, forget all this, the crazy stuff that we wouldn't have expected January 1 of this year. And let's just talk about the run-up of the last 12 years since the 08 debacle. We all know that we're two years ahead of, of the longest bull run we've ever seen. And based on that, we, we would all expect to see some sort of a, a, a correction, a healthy correction. Something was good for the market. Yep. And, and my perception of a healthy correction is a 20% decline in values from the peak that lasted a duration 18 months or longer. That's usually a pretty good definition of a correction. Right. We haven't had anything like that. Well, we've had 20% drops in values. We had it again in March. But these things have lasted days or weeks. I mean, very short periods of time, and we haven't had any sustained correction. Uh, so we're we're due, regardless of all these things. Now we get all these things to boot, and there's a lot of artificial uh, propping that's gone on with the uh, federal stimulus and the corporate bond market, seven hundred billion dollars, uh, uh, and and uh, and we've had all the stimulus, but payday is coming, and payday will will get here. And we, we have a hard fathomability about what's going to happen. And so that, that's the creation of the question that you ask is what, what do we not know that we need to know that that steps us up on the plate? So I think uh, the one thing that we need to be very cognitive of as we're working with our clients, and let me speak about uh, clients preparing for retirement. What I, what I mean by that is clients within 10 years of retirement. Now, we're, we boldly talk to our clients 20 years before retirement, if they'll let us, not everybody will, mm-hmm. or 15. But, but usually 10 is a reasonable time frame to say, you better at least start the conversation and you better start the projections. And when that's true, uh, one of the things that we have to focus on first and foremost is not just allocation, but relocation of assets to income so that we can allocate to long-term growth and making sure we have plenty of liquidity. And what what comes with that in performance is as much about tax mitigation, fee drag mitigation, 
inflation mitigation as it is performance of the underlying portfolio. And that's where the insurance products are paramount. Really? Because the things that we create for tax cannot be done with a stock bond, a mutual fund, or real estate investment trust. And with that being said, I know you're a firm that does a lot of life insurance. And there's a, there's a significant amount of planning that can be done for the long-term, the estate planning, as well as retirement planning that focus purely on the tax mitigation that's possible with, with life insurance. And it's getting our head around what are those things that, that are included in that and understanding how the different chassis of products that do work. Because we have, the, we have this thing called life insurance as a death benefit, which is based on product allocations today. That's, a, that's an entirely different product a lineup than if I'm talking about life insurance as an asset class for tax-free income. And that's a tip, that's a whole different chassis and whole different model. And there's a whole there's a, there's a series of models that one would look at given the risk tolerance and the appetite that the, the client may be willing to to take. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of fodder in here for us to learn. <laughs> Products are constantly changing. Of course, we got all this interest rate pressure makes it very difficult for manufacturers to compete and then keep the propped up promises. Um, but it's an exciting time, challenging time, but exciting time. And so for a new advisor, there's a lot of challenge here uh, to, to learn. Uh, I, I would be remiss, Matt, if I didn't say this very, very early and upfront in our session. The reason that I got in the financial industry predominantly was because of my own financial advisor. And uh, I'll try to be brief by saying this, but when I was- How old were you this, back then? What's that? How old were you back then? I was 23. Wow. But I was the same age when I entered the field. Wow. Isn't that right? Interesting. So, so here's, here's, here's my, my quick story is I grew up pretty much between the knees of my grandfather on a John Deere 50. And you might remember hearing some of these lines back sure. 10 years ago. <laughs> but I, I was very close to my grandfather on the farm in Iowa. And my grandfather was a, a loving, uh, anecdotal sort of guy. He didn't have a lot of words, but the words he has said always seemed to matter. And he had really three easy principles of life for me that I followed. Then they were, they were this, hate debt. He, he lost the family farm in depression. The banks went belly up in Kissock, Iowa. And uh, he lost the family farm, third generation farm. He was 18 because his parents were ill. And so I, I've come to realize that granddad was afraid of all debt, whether it was good debt or bad debt. And I've now been able to at least uh, improve my education to say what's good debt, bad debt. So I don't, I don't agree that every debt or all debt is bad, but, but knowing the difference is important. Second thing was to give 10% to others. The, the third thing was to save 10% for us. Now, he's talking about doing that young. If you don't do it young, and now it's 20 or maybe 30 or maybe 40 that you have to save. But, but I start saving, mowing my lawns, shoveling my walks in the wintertime, and helping my granddad and his neighbors on the farm. And I saved 10 cents out every dollar from the age of nine. By the time I was 25, I had $100,000 saved up. Why? Not because I made a lot of money because I saved a little out of every bit for a long time. And by the time I was 25, I'd been doing a fair amount of work during those years, all because of granddad, right? Well, granddad had a couple of other anecdotes. And he says, when you find what, out what God really designed you to be, and you find success, and that's determined by you, he says, it's time to consume less and give more. And be sure before you die, you create more than you consume. Nice. And so he was very philanthropic in his uh, advice. And it was, uh, it was not just about me, it was about others. And so uh, because I'd followed his advice, by the time I was 17, I bought my first house. Of course, you can't really technically own a house in Iowa at 17. My dad had to sign for it and then turn it back over to me when I turned 18. But I gutted that house and rebuilt it by tearing a two-story house down and stripping the lumber. And uh, I, I had a brand new house that I built and paid off by age 21. Wow. I had $120,000 of paid up life insurance prepaid and a $10,000 annuity by the age of 21. And finally, $3,500 in an old fund you might remember called Fidelity Magellan. Look at that, look at that. <laughs> now, listen, that wasn't a lot of money, but for a, a 21 year old who'd made very little, most had ever made the year was 18,000 at that time, that's a lot of money to save. By the way, by the time I was 21, I had two kids and was married. Okay. So my advisor recognized when he came to my home 18 months into my disability 
that uh, something had changed. I gained 100 pounds, flat bed rest. From, I got injured in the gypsum mine. I was also working in the gypsum mine besides the farm, and they got hurt down in the mine, 630 feet in the ground. And so the antidote was there was the bad bed, flat bed rest for a couple of years, or fa- 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 actually for, for, for one year, I ballooned 100 pounds. And when uh, Leon, his name, came to my house, he realized that, that I really thought I was dried up, that I wasn't going to be in a hill of beans. And I'll never forget, as we left the kitchen table, went to the foyer of my home, he put his hand on the knob of my door, spun around, and he looked at me, and he says, now, Curtis, I want you to know something. He says, I know very few men twice your age that's made so little and accomplished so much. And you have very little book knowledge about what it is that I do. But you're a perfect specimen of the best client I could ever have. And you need to be doing what I do because you don't need to be told. You already believe. And you believe because of your grandfather. So it did, I didn't believe him at first. It took him a year, dragging in Poland. But he finally got me into the industry. And that wow. ended up sending me to Prudential after I did a little research about five companies for the best training program at the time. Proof. And um, I will tell you, for the first two years, it sucked. Why? I hated my job. And I looked at in the Help One ads every day, every day. Uh, but about six months in the business, I had one of my church board members. I was on the ch- church board. One of my church board members came to me. And he and four other buddies were buying a, a $60 million general contracting company. They did $60 million in gross revenues annually, and they needed a buy-sell agreement. Now, remember, yep. I'm, 20, I'm 23. I'm, tw- I'm Actually, I'm 23, and I'm six months in the business, and I'm not having a lot of success. And, then, and his question after that church board meeting was, hey, we're getting ready to do a buy-sell agreement. We need $10 million of total life Oof. insurance dollars. He says, what do you know about buy-sell agreements? What do you think I told him? <laughs> I know everything about buy I know everything. Now, remember, <laughs> I was in church. <laughs> and how much do you think I actually knew? <laughs> Zero. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> well, I will tell you that I signed up for every class, including the business insurance courses one and two with LUTC. And I went to a class in Iowa City where a fellow by the name of Tim Sellner was doing a class on family estate buy sell agreements. And I went up to Tim during that at the end of that class and said, I got this case down Burlington, Iowa. Would you help me with it? Well, he became my first mentor and it took us two years, but I closed that case. Nah. $2 million dollars of permanent whole life insurance. Not because I was the smartest guy in the room, but I realized my limitations and the, and the clients in that business. So per, appreciated, first of all, the integrity by the fact that, that one of the church board members knew one of the members knew who it was, but that uh, I, I didn't tell him I knew everything when I got to the finally to the table, but I had all the answers with the expert. And so mentorship for me was the key to actually getting to a day. I stopped looking at the help wanted ads. And I realized that I could do this. By the way, I never used Tim Sellner again for a single buy sell agreement. Why? Because he taught me how to do it. I learned learned how to do it. And that really kickstarted my career in the life insurance industry, working on corporate plans, individual life, and estate planning. So the first thing that's really important to your new advisors who are starting out is don't underestimate the power of mentorship. And for you, you superior agents or your mature agents have been out there. We always need to be building into somebody coming up. And we always need to be, we always need to be hitching with that person coming up to, to keep our feet hard on the ground. And so that's, I think that's as good of advice as you can get coming out of the gate. hundred percent, Curtis. You know, the, the thing about the, the, the evolution of the life insurance industry, you know, the, the average agent getting older and not necessarily a new batch of a younger agent coming to the marketplace. It's, it's, it's in, in, my, in my 21 years in the industry, I've just seen such a detachment of mentorship inside our industry. And so, so, you know, when you can find a mentor, man, hold on to them, man. And I, I'm just curious, when you close that case, did you split with your mentor 50-50 on that? On that no, it was a 60-40. He got 40. I got 60. That was our deal. Nice. My share was 160,000 in a single day. One case. One case. Now, here, here's the truth. I did my best to calculate all the money I made mowing lawns, shoveling walks. I was a bus boy at 12 before the laws that exist today. As a bus boy at Country Kitchen, I was a men's water salesman at J.C. Penney. I was a gas station attendant at Chick Standard, changing water pumps and tires. I did my best to calculate my earnings collectively since the, I started working. I made more in a single day and I collectively made my whole entire life all because of mentorship and 40% of that went to somebody else. Listen, that was a great day. 
And I realized about 30 days later when I was driving home that it had been 30 days since I looked at a help one ad in the paper. And I asked myself the question as I looked out the hood of my car out my windshield, what changed? And, it, and I noticed that my suits were still from the resale shop. I didn't spend any money. I was still driving the 77 Buick LeSabre with 250,000 miles on it. I was driving the same house, the same wife, same kids. The only thing that changed was between my ears. It was the confidence that I could do it. And when we get mentorship, we gain a lot of confidence when we find quality, ethical, honest, and expert mentorship. The, the, the downside sometimes we find in the marketplace, sometimes greed kicks in. And a lot of, lots of times guys can think, well, I could just watch this YouTube video, watch this YouTube video, uh, read this book, and I can try to close it by myself 100%. What would, you sell to, what would you say to that agent who's trying to do everything himself and they really have no experience in it? Well, first of all, when you're doing buy-sell agreements or retirement planning, the the gravity at stake is so high for the consumer. Could you imagine that being brain surgery and you're trying to do it to yourself on YouTube? Come on. Uh, and, and I would say, you know, if that's your mentality, you probably need a different job. Correct. Because we're talking about laser surgery here in the financial industry. And until we get the knowledge and the education, we need mentorship. And that's just a fact. 100%. You know, one of the things I read here in, in your article, you know, uh, you were just here a couple of weeks ago, I think, to speak at NIFA, at the National Association yeah, of yeah. Advisors. I missed you. I was out of town. But, um, you know, you, you, you start with Pru. And isn't it kind of interesting to see, you know, the captive, the captive shops, the career shops has started to really, you know, peak down to see. I mean, how is it like for you to see uh, MetLife? sell off all their agents to Mass Mutual, and they, were, they had 18,000, 30,000 agents at one point. Yeah, so there were a lot of companies, and Peru was one of them, although Peru still has their agency system, and they're, depending on what year and time, they're, they're either growing it or depleting it. Um, but we had the, a lot of demutualization that went on back in the yeah. early 2000s, and, uh, and so Met, Met, that was MetLife. They demutualized, and of course, they get become run yeah, by- Yeah, MetLife, MetLife. Right. They, they got they got run by uh, stock jockeys, and and now it was the quarterly earnings more than it was the the the, the, the clientele, and that's what drove the, the the whole the whole bus. And and I actually was one of the advisors that was called in. It was twelve of us called in down to Charlotte, North Carolina, to advise MetLife when the transition happened to Bright House, yeah. and that we were the first to hear the word Bright House, and it was like shocking to me. I was like, what the heck am I actually doing here, and why did they call me? But uh, that was a shocking trend. And I will tell you that though we do do some business with Bright House and we have some old business with MetLife, I can tell you that there's been a lot of debacle with a lot of this insurance and the companies that have bought and sold and repositioned with service and for illustrations. And there's a lot of headaches out there that we have to watch. There's a little bit, if you're new, you don't need to like, you don't need to burden yourself with all that data, but that's what your mentors is going to help you avoid is who do you sell today that you can count on tomorrow? Because there's a lot of old names that we thought we could count on tomorrow, and it tomorrow is today, and we're shocked. I yeah. think Met, Met Life, and again, I like Met Life. We still sell Met Life. Bright Up, we love our wholesaler, by the way. But they're an example of service gone wrong. Yeah. And so you got to be careful that you really understand who it is you're selling. And you got to have a profitable business, and you have to have a, a business – uh, that's uh, not too uh, difficult to service clients. Yeah, that that was a shocking thing for me when I was reading. The, I was reading the journal that day, and I was wow. MetLife sold their agents to Mass Mutual, and I think the average uh, agent just to show the value of a life insurance agent today is something like seventy thousand dollars per agent is what they basically cut the check for. So shocking to see that. So, um, you know, so going forward, Curtis, you know, uh, before I jump into the next topic here, what we think a Biden era uh, presidency is going to be looking like in, in terms of impact on tax and retirement plans. But what, what, what are we looking at here in terms of post-pandemic? Well, what are some of the rough lessons we learned in the pandemic of 2020 as it relates to just planning our finances? Because the last time something like this happened was, I think, the Spanish flu in, in uh, what, 1918 or something like that. So yeah, we you know, years ago. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that, um, uh, the, the, the risk is, I got I want to be really careful here, Matt, for your viewership, not to, sure. to say anything that would be dissensitive or, or, or political in any way, but let's just be realist about what where we're at uh, with sure. regards to this election and what administration seems to be pointing to 
to the next gener- administration and and what they've told us. Let's just go right off of what they've told us. Um, they've told us a couple of things, but we can read between the lines. Let me give you a couple of them. One is if you make four, under four hundred thousand dollars, you have no increase in taxes. But then the next breath, they said immediately upon being uh, becoming president of the United States, they were going to eliminate all the tax changes 2018 that Trump did. Now, I want to tell you something. I had this conversation this morning. I have an enrolled agent with the IRS and a CPA on staff. And because we do dynamic taxes in our software program for retirement, and we update that, and we see the reality of our actual clients in terms of tax. And the reality is, I'm going to say this, we're in Burlington, Iowa, and it's a a service factory industry kind of city with a, a lot of agricultural. So there's not a ton of wealthy people here. These are, these are households that generate 80 to 120,000 of income predominantly. And that would represent 90% of our local clients. Now we do business in all 50 States. Those tend to be high net worth clients, but because we have so many of them, I can tell you that our average client in that income range, 80 to 120 saved on average $1,500 after the 18th law tax changes. And there were very few, but 5% 5% that that wasn't true for actually paid more in tax. And that the fact is those that paid more in tax had enough uh, deductions they could itemize under the old rule that it was more than the doubling of the standard deduction. And so they lost that difference. Well, that, that the deductions that the rest of our clients had were less than the doubling of the standard deduction. So they saw a bigger refund, but they also then saw a, a higher paycheck because part of the tax law changes that ultimately came down was, was less tax withheld your paycheck every pay period. So you might see a little less tax refund, but the collection of the two parts or pieces, it generated on average about $1,500 in tax savings. Well, here's what I do know. If they eliminate the tax changes of 2018 of Trump, those clients are going to see a $1,500 increase in their taxes and anywhere close to $400,000. We really don't know except what we've been told what to expect. And that means knowing how to mitigate taxes going forward and how our products integrate and interact with our portfolios, their retirement plans and their estate plans as it relates to our insurance products combined with our investment products is going to be paramount as a key instructor as to why our products are valuable. And these products will not get selected on their own from a website by consumers. Only term insurance will be true of that. Sure. These are the products that have to be educated and they have to be sold. Why, why do you think that life insurance, I mean, everybody gets information from real estate, whether it be real estate investing or buying real estate itself as a, as a, as a homeowner, uh, buying stocks, mutual funds. I mean, all these wonderful websites and apps that you can download. How come life insurance just doesn't get the exposure and the access to education? And when I sit down with people in the last 21 years, I'm seeing, yo, this is a, a large a concentrated life insurance. And I find out why. And I'm like, let me funnel this information down to the multicultural middle class because they're not exposed to they, they're exposed to GoFundMe and they're more reactive to their their money and their and their their, their planning versus proactive. Why doesn't life insurance get its exposure just like everybody else does? And it well, respect is an asset class. There's, there's clearly a multifaceted reason, but there are two or three I think that that rise to the surface. The first one is the the, the word insurance denotes a cost, and I'm not suggesting there aren't costs you can delineate uh, and define that are their real costs in, in life insurance, whether it's term or, or whole life or UL or, or whatever it happens to be. The reality though is that depending on the application of that insurance in the life of a client and their local story, the mitigation of tax as it relates to the growth of the value of that life insurance policy against the alternative of after-tax contribution or pre-tax contribution, growing those dollars either in the market or in a safe position over time, they they create an advantage for some of our clients that need to be highlighted that make them a better return than the investments they would use. So so the one is the perception that it's insurance and it's always a pure cost. There's never going to be a true benefit. That gets in the way of our minds. The second one is because Life insurance is a selfless act initially because we have to have it a long time before it becomes a great investment. And that means we have to, I call it a four letter word, 
It's not life, L-A-F-E, it's L-O-V-E. It's because we love somebody. It has to be a love in our life to care about having life insurance at the front end. And sometimes that, I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm saying it's just in human nature. If there's a cost and if somebody gets fed and I may never get to experience it, that, that kind of gets pitched to the, to the side of the road if they think there's something that puts them more first and still gives them the benefit. And sure, so sure. that becomes a clear picture. And then, uh, and then the third is, is regulations. They don't let us talk about this product as an investment. We're forced to talk about it in the same light for which they perceive it, and that's insurance cost. Our job is to find within, within the regulations, identifying the love in, in the lives of our clients that also create better than investment-like returns based on the application of how the policies are being used to highlight that ethically and within the compliance arrangements that we're that we have to live within to still show the benefit and educate our clients about why those policies and and and, and those portfolios make sense. Gotcha. Very good. When we're looking at where the new government has taken over, um, I, I think this year 2020, I think the RMD, you don't have to take out an RMD uh, as it relates to your IRA. But when when, when we're looking at uh, your job as an adjunct professional at the American College, and to see you know your boss here, you know uh, George Nichols, you know just to see him here too as well. The you know the 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 uh, the guy that's in charge of the American College. I mean to see an African American now in charge of the American College of Financial Planning. I mean and, and, and financial and, and education with inside financial services. You know is this now a dawning of a new era that we not we must filter this education because it's not like you go to your state public college to understand about financial services. It is only through secondary or uh, other education that you get access to yourself. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, George here leading the way, but he talks about how, you know, this interesting part of this article, how um, uh, he goes, let's just face it. The reality that I might typically start as a life insurance agent, but ultimately I'm going into get into wealth management. So, so, so life insurance is a conversation, but wealth management that's what it, it's a portal to, to establishing wealth and then managing that after that. Yeah. So Wade Fowl, one of the professors at the American College, does a lot of research and him, him and I speak and write sometimes together. Wade Fowl talks about the basket of products approach and understand that these products that we have, insurance products, annuities, life insurance, long-term care, along with stocks, bonds, mutual funds, these are all tools. And I want you to imagine for a minute, just for a metaphor, Matt, that we're auto mechanics for Cadillac dealership instead of financial advisors or okay. life insurance sales guys. Now, if we're going to be a Cadillac mechanic, literally, and, and, I'm, and, and I'm not being figurative, I'm being literal here, you probably have a Matco or Snap-on toolbox, red, that's a wide box, floor to ceiling probably, and at least a thousand tools in that box. At least, there's probably more. Okay. Now, your job as the mechanic mechanic is to understand what each of those tools uniquely or universally will accomplish. Correct. Now imagine, let's apply it to our world. Imagine you buy the Cadillac and, and, your, and your sales guy says, hey, we got the best mechanics, Cadillac mechanics in the world. Two years later, you have a squeaky right, right front wheel. And you pull it into the service manager and you describe the problem. Pretty soon the mechanic comes out and he drives it to the bay. And before he starts even looking at the problem, he puts his favorite three tools in his hands and he walks out into the vestibule and he starts bragging about his tools. Hasn't even diagnosed the problem yet. Wouldn't that be ridiculous? Oh, look at this crescent wrench. Look at this. Look, look at this uh, ratchet. I mean, that would be the most ridiculous thing. And, and, and I want you to think about it in a funny sort of way. Don't we kind of do that sometimes in this industry? Sure. Can, can I just say stop it? <laughs> stop it. Yeah. Don't do that. And then let me let me let me let me yep. let me do a different scenario. So let's say they didn't do that, but he, he came out into the vestibule where he's drinking coffee and watching TV, and he asked the couple to come back to, the, to his bay, and he he shows them. He goes, "Hey, look, I I pulled the tire off. I got the hub off, and there's a bearing on there on the hub. Now I have to, I have to pull the bearing off, and I got to press a new one on. I can't hammer it off. I'll damage the shaft." But he said, uh, "You know, look at that toolbox. I got a thousand tools in there, and he's bragging about his tools." Because there's one tool in there I hate, but it ain't in there. I don't have that tool. There's one tool I hate, and it's not in the box. It's called the bearing puller. 
Barry okay. Puller. <laughs> but I need a Barry Puller, but I, don't, I just don't like it. Well, can you imagine telling a client like Ken Fisher, I hate annuities. Can you imagine that? It's a tool that does a job. There's right. 42 types of them. Some of them had no fee drag. Some of them have exclusion tax ratio fee drag. They're not even taxed the same. They're not even the same complexion of the product. And he's talking about one type of annuity, and yet he's painting all of them to the consumers as though they're one. But it's a tool that if you need it on that day to pull the bearing off the shaft, you can't fix the damn car if the tool's not in the toolbox. Metaphorically, we need to know what the tools do, only what they do. We need to know how to face the discovery of the problems and the persuasions our clients have with a good discovery questionnaire and then we know what is in our toolbox and we get back to what Wade Faust says, a basket, of, a, a basket approach of tools. And then we need to pull the tools out together. So on average, doing a retirement plan, there's eight tools. And what I mean by that is there's probably some, some sort of an income guarantee from some annuity. It could be a SPIA, a DIA, could be a QLAC, could be an FI income rider, GLWB, GMIB, one of those products. It's definitely going to include some equities for hyperinflation risk. Yep. Probably some bonds might include life insurance, but one of the components that generally should be considered, and there's a life insurance policy. It's part of the retirement plan. Um, lots of reasons. We don't have time to get into all those reasons, but the point is you can't solve it just with stocks and bonds, and you can't solve it with just annuities or life insurance, but how, if you can figure out the basket of products approach and how to see the, the products as tools to fix a problem and not tools to exclusively sell, yeah. you'll sell more of every use of every tool in your toolbox if you become a good discovery and then know how to apply those tools. And you'll sell more of everything else at the same time. And if there's a story for myself and my practice that's true, that's the most true is I've learned that principle. It's an amazing story. You know, when, when I'm thinking about running across a typical client, and the, the, the run across the typical person that we're recruiting into the insurance industry, they're so jaded and confused about what's going on. They don't do anything. That, that's the downside to it. They're like conflicting so many different. I don't do this. Don't do that. Government says this, this commercial says that my agent says this and they're paralyzed paralysis by analysis. They don't do anything. And, you know, I, I've, I've, uh, you know, the last five and a half years of us agency building, I've come across more competition coming from, confusion and procrastination than an actual person, you know, trying to get the business from another advisor, or another agent. It just doesn't happen in our field. It's, it's you know, every, every once in a while, if we find ourselves in a special position where our talents and creativity can fix a problem yep. that's creating this confusion, uh, sometimes we're asked to step up. So let me tell you a quick story about Ken Fisher. I remember, <laughs> I remember listening to his commercials in the airplanes in first class with that TV on the headset in the back of the seat in front of me. Or come good mark any. Come, come, come to our website, nudibunk.com and blah, 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 about annuities. And it would piss me off every time I said it because I realized he was talking about one of 42 types of annuities that the other types didn't have any, any reflection whatsoever of what he was talking about that he was describing. And so I, I thought about this for a long time. And one day, actually it was last year, I was heading to Philadelphia to go to my speaker's coach. And I said, I'm going to do it. So I grabbed my phone and I went on Google because I have Wi-Fi on the plane. And I went to, I didn't go to Google. I went to GoDaddy and I checked for some URLs. I bought the URL that says KenFisherAnnuityBunk.com. Fisher Investments, Bunk.com. Fisher Investments, AnnuityBunk.com. And uh -oh. I bought all three of those URLs. Well, here's what I knew would happen. A big company like that who's protected their IP for a long time, they have lawyers on staff and they've got those alerts. And it took longer than I expected, but about six months later, you got, got your your legal documents all from their from their lawyers that said, "Oh, we see that you got these URLs, and you need to give them back to us." And I said, "I'd be happy to, more than happy to." And yes, I understand how this works. I have 26 uh, trademarks myself, and one patent. I appreciate the laws that they exist for this, but I'm going to tell you something. We need to have a dialogue about what you're doing to confuse the consumer. And I said, well, there is going to be a discussion about what you're doing and, and how to clean it up because as much as you don't want us to damage your name, we as an industry are really ticked off at how you're damaging our name. And you're misrepresenting a broad-based product 
as though all represent the one for which you're pointing out by using an exclusive name. And that allowed me the conversation with the internal folks. And no one on this call has seen a Ken Fisher annuity bunk advertisement since that agreement really? was put in place. You haven't seen one. And I stopped those ads. I gave them back their URL. Wow. And sometimes we're just called to make a difference. Yep. And we don't get paid a dime. In fact, it cost me something to do that, but not more than my time, probably, but, but not a lot of money. The point is, sometimes we step up when we can really make a difference. And I don't know how and why I thought of doing that, but I did, and it did make a difference. Huge difference. I appreciate that, Curtis. Didn't know that, man. So, hey, guys, for those of you watching this, make sure you give some love to Curtis Cloak here for helping you out directly <laughs> and indirectly if you didn't know it. Um, I got one. I got one. Maybe considered a political question here, more economical. But you know, it's been shocking to me um, just to see myself going. You know, your, yourself too as well, going from nowhere to somewhere. Rags the riches started with very little. Now you have a lot. When you see the conversation about capitalism versus socialism, and socialism getting so much of a attention and getting included into how people are now are voting. And, 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 and I, I get it. If you want to be a capitalist socialist, great, no problem. But just don't let it, don't command it from the state. But now it, it's, it seems like things from up top are saying, okay, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. Like, kind of like what we're doing with this pandemic right now. It's kind of irritating and, and very annoying because we're facing basically a second shutdown right now here at the, at the tail end of uh, 2020. What are your thoughts about, you know, that, that conversation being more uh, paid attention to it and, and people you know, really saying, okay, I really like where socialism is going versus capitalism. What's your thoughts on that, Curtis? Yeah. So the reality of socialism as it, as it relates to our current situation here in the U.S. with the two sides of the parties, it's very clear that the, the, the narrative, if I were to take it at high level and then just say what it is, it's really a, a distribution of wealth to those that weren't so successful making those that were wealthy and took all the risk less wealthy. So those that are not as wealthy become more wealthy. It's a redistribution of wealth, whether you deserved it or not. And it's also about folks that uh, weren't born in this country and came over, not legally, but in an illegal way. And I know that these are live hearts beating. I get it. That should care about people. I'm not talking about being desensitive or anything like, but it's giving people, that was not intended when the actuarial studies for Social Security and Medicare were developed. And suddenly those numbers come by the millions and maybe by the billions. There's no way that we as a society can support those events. And now on top of that, there were families, there were mothers whose husbands died or left them who worked three and four jobs and didn't even get to raise their kids. Sometimes on the South side of Chicago, just so their kids could go to school. Big sacrifice. And those kids had to go to school and do their studies in very extreme circumstances. And you've got story after story of how they climbed the mountain and how they prevailed on the other side. Well, if we just pay for everybody, how, how, how does that create cost for a society for those that are paying taxes and paying the bill? And how fair is that to those mothers and grandmothers who sacrifice and those kids in those circumstances who sacrifice so much? And so if, if I'm going to gain something, whether I sacrifice, fight hard or not, versus I get it if I'm willing to sacrifice and go get it, we will have an entitled society that will change the climate forever. And um, I just want you to think about this. Pretty much, I'm pretty sure that most advisors would love to find a job where they pay them a stipend salary. Right? 100% commission base, right? <laughs> no commission. Just pay me a salary. Trust me, I'll do the job. But sure. hundreds of studies out there of that being tried. And it's amazing when you say, no, eat what you kill. You know, the good rises. The people are willing to pay the price, take the sacrifice, learn what they need to learn, do what they need to do, serve the people, get creative. Those are the ones that win. We'll, we'll stop seeing those winners or those winners will deplete significant numbers when we have a society that says all get the same. And, and again, 
try not to be political, but just talking about human nature and the way it works. Our ability to give advice using these products and this VASCA products approach that we're describing gets greatly uh, disadvantaged when the tax environment changes to cover those costs. And can you imagine making a million dollars and the tax gets so high that you're making less than if you made $250,000? What's the incentive? And what's in, what incentive if I'm making $250,000 that I have to pay so much in taxes at a million that my net after all the drag of costs that I have to spend is no more than what I would net after 250? Who would ever take the risk to get that climb? And what kind of change would we see to the jobs and the opportunities for the general populace that depend on those jobs to get there? So I'm not suggesting that these are all in of the topics that we're talking about, but certainly a debate that's worthwhile. I think it's an honest debate. It's, a, it's, a, it's an open debate and not a, an accusatory debate. But we as financial advisors need to be quite concerned about the validity of our job and the value we can bring at the level we can do at this point if capitalism fails and socialism prevails. Wow. Wow. Profound. Um, let's talk. Well, let's talk about the industry. You know, uh, you know, people right now getting shut down. People are probably laid off in the third, fourth, maybe in fifth time. People are back from part time to full time. These restaurants are fighting to stay open, even with DoorDash and Grubhub, you know, delivering their, you know, their food. But, you know, what would you say to somebody who's making serious consideration of coming into life insurance industry, which has been the least affected industry? You mentioned it earlier at the beginning of, your, of our conversation here. You're, you're, you're ready to catch this virtual Zoom uh, uh, world and, and to still deploy your services via Zoom and still help people uh, online with, with insurance and financial services. What would you say to somebody that's maybe like myself coming from the military or working at Jiffy Lube or, 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 uh, or, or uh, was a server, a restaurant manager? What would you say to them, them about entering this very noble profession? Well, what I would say to you is that serving others is a high regard, must be a, a staple of your makeup and, 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 and who you are. Um, and the willingness to be coached and the willingness to commit to, to learning and understand is a lot to know. Uh, all I can tell you is I went from, and this is a fun way of saying this, I went from 630 feet underground, chipping rock to selling it above ground all the way to top of the table. Been top of the table now 12 years with MDRT. Million dollar round table, yeah. And uh, I've spoken there now many, many, many times, including this year's international conference. And I actually spoke in Australia at the global conference in, in Sydney last, uh, what, last August or September. I can tell you that if I can do this as a young boy on the farm, working in a gypsum mine with no formal education, to actually develop financial software that's licensed all around the country, registered by some advisor firms and retirement experts, I can be a professional speaker, globally speaking, 200 days a year, own a practice in three states, a financial practice, significant life, annuity, and investment sales, all while being now an adjunct professor of the American College, writing curriculum for the RECP. If I can do that from where I began, I promise you anybody can do it because there's nothing uniquely special about me except my work ethic, my integrity, Am I willing to sacrifice to serve? And if you've got that makeup and you want to make a lot of money, but you want to make it for the right reasons, this could be a business to really consider. Love it. Uh, what, what skills, uh, by the way, profound answer there, Curtis, what, what skills do you think? If I say, you know what, what skill? Is it, is it financial skills, people skills, telephone skills? What skills would you say are, about, are the most important to enter this field with and to develop? Well, since for me, when I came in, high academics wasn't the issue. <laughs> um, though though I, was, I guess I was pretty good at math. Uh, that might have been one of my favorite subjects. Um, it was people skills. And, and, and I had the people skills with caring skills. And, and the reason that I say that is when I came and got my, I was a debit agent. I wasn't an ordinary agent for Prudential. Uh, you're, what? I collected a debit. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> knock, knock, knock. Here's your premium. All right. Thank you. That's what yeah, you do. That's what I did. And I remember what was fun about that was my kids, because I had them very young. My first child, I had five days after my 18th birthday. 
Wow. Uh, the kids would argue over whose turn it was to go with dad collect the debit because they took turns. And the reason was this was the hot chocolate house. This is the root beer house. This is a, this is the chocolate chip house. <laughs> and the, and the, and the, and the clients loved it. And so my kids fought whose turn it was. So when my son 14 years ago said, Hey dad, I want to come work with you after engineering school. And they found out that he was coming to work and they started working with him. Guess what? I never got him back. <laughs> they oh, want to wow. work with Josh. But, wow. but, the, but, the, but, the, but what I was getting ready to say is my love to impact others was better, you know, than my, than my people skills. And maybe that was my people skill because when I come into Prudential, there were a lot of, of advisors before me and there was a big rotating door. I was the sixth agent on that debit in three years. So you can imagine when I called clients to introduce myself, how they would dismiss me because there was a revolving door of agents coming in and out that door and no one ever stuck. And so the way that I created any traction at all was I identified complaints. The office gave me all the complaints. And so I heard about every agent before the current, I mean, everything pretty much that was going on as it related to bad sales and, and the, 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 the kind of slimy versus the accredited. And I would go to Prudential and I'd draft a lot of letters and I fixed problems for senior clients. Why? Because every time I saw a senior client, I saw the eyes of my grandparents. Mm. And that's enough to drive my people skills and my care and love skills. And I'd fix their problems and then they would just give me all their money. Yep. And we do a lot of business. And that's where I did find success on my own was just fixing problems by being the complaint guy because they didn't ever want to give me good leads. Yep. I had to fix something first. And you know, today I still have clients that I work with. Uh, I still remember, in fact, I heard from them today. My first investment client, the only reason I got him as an investment client was I fixed a big problem for him on a, on a debacle life insurance sale first. And so this stuff comes back tenfold if we're willing to give it. Um, we just have to be willing to sacrifice on the front end. And uh, it's very rewarding. Awesome. You know, the, again, our YouTube channel is a seven figure squad where people think like a millionaire to strategize like a millionaire. So therefore they can become a first generation cash flow millionaire, which is you, Curtis, you're a first generation cash flow millionaire. How is, you know, being on both sides of money, right? Being on both sides of money. What would you say to somebody? What would you say to your 20 year old self, 20 back to 23 years ago? You've run across a 23 year old version of you out there. Curtis Cloak Jr. What would you tell them? about getting to the seven-figure squad, getting to seven-figure income? If you find a way, this is a Zig Ziglarism, I guess, but if you find a way to do what others don't want to do to get people what they want, you just get a whole lot of what you want. And, and when you get there, you know, here's the principle of my grandfather, is to love people and use money and don't get those two things turned around. Mm. I love it. Uh, Curtis, I see Thrive University behind you. Where can more people find more information about you, your work, and what you're doing for the advisor insurance community? Yeah, so they go to uh, curtiscloak.com, and there'll, there'll be four different trails on the, on the, on the ribbon at the top. You can, uh, you can look at my speaking site. You can look at Thrive University events. We don't obviously have, don't have any live events going on, but we are planning a December and, and an early, uh, uh, early 2021 event which we'll post that. And Matt, if you don't mind us giving you the invite, you want to post the invite, you certainly could. Sure, and sure. we'll do, we're going to do, uh, those are normally two day uh, educational events for advisors, but we're going to do uh, some four hour events just because it's hard to do eight hours on a virtual, you know, so we're just going to break it in eight, four hours and we'll, we'll ladder the education. So if you come to one and don't come to the next, it, you'll, you'll still have something to gain. If you come to the next, you'll ladder that knowledge on top of one another but we'll, we'll post those out here pretty quick. And then, uh, and then it, there is a, an online training that you can go to. If you, uh, you can actually text to get this website, you can text uh, thrive, you T H R I V E U letter U to six, 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 eight, six, 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 eight, six, six. That's you text it to six, six, eight, six, six. And it will take it last for your email. You'll give me your email in the text. And then it will give you the link and you can go out and sign up for the Thrive University online, which is kind of an, an introduction to the live course. And then finally is the Retirement Next Gen software, which uh, we, we kind of are, are all inclusive. We provide the knowledge, the education, the RECP. Uh, we, we provide the two-day workshop classes. We've actually created a turnkey system with the words to say, the PowerPoint for the front end meeting. We have the second meeting, the third meeting. 
uh, that, 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 that we teach you how to do. But then we built the tools. We built the software. And then we also have a back office and lake team that will pair a plan for a third party hire on a retainer basis for those that don't have enough volume yet to hire their own pair planner and use them on an on-demand basis. All that information is posted out there at curtiscloak.com. That's C-U-R-T-I-S, cloak, C-L-O-K-E.com. Curtis, I appreciate you, man. Thank you for being a leader in the industry and uh, and helping guys and gals out there entering this field have confidence and clarity when it comes to help and serve other people. And what you said earlier, uh, helping other people do that selfless act of planning for their financial future, man. So Curtis Cloak, man, I appreciate you guys. For those of you watching this, make sure you drop your comments below. Make sure you follow Curtis Cloak. Go to his website, check him out and what he's about. And if uh, you got your thoughts, I'd love to know your comments. Love to know your feedback in the comment section below. And if you're watching this on Facebook, make sure you click like, subscribe to our Facebook page, Money Smart Guy, mash that like button. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click subscribe and hit notifications to be alerted the next time we upload our next episode. So that being said, guys, on behalf of Curtis Cloak, I'm your Money Smart Guy. And until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, be money smart today. Curtis, appreciate you, buddy. Thank you, Matt. It's great to be with you after all these years. Thank <laughs> you.